Thank you for coming this afternoon, um, particularly since we have this perfectly gorgeous day outside after a perfectly awful day before. Uh, so I would understand if people wanted to be out and about. Um, my name is Barbara Bodine, and um, I have the honor and privilege of being the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. And uh, this afternoon, we are hosting this event on religious intolerance and America's image and policies abroad. And we have a, a fairly full and rich program, so I'm going to keep my remarks and introductions brief. Um, and uh, begin by introducing our Dean, Joel Hellman, uh, who has been with us for three years now, is a scholar and practitioner in his own right with a very strong background uh, in the World Bank, working on conflict and other issues, and has his degree from Columbia and the University of Oxford. So, Dean Hellman. Thank you so much, Barbara. Welcome to spring in Washington, D.C. Um, I hope some of you were, take it out, were able to take out a hair dryer and de-ice the cherry blossoms to sort of see them. Um, uh, but it is wonderful to have you here, and it is a brilliant sun, a sunny day at least. Um, let me welcome all our honored guests today. Let me um, uh, welcome our distinguished panelists and, of course, um, all of you who are here with us. I want to thank you for joining us. Today's event may seem like an odd one uh, for the School of Foreign Service and the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy to host. It's centered on the question of domestic religious intolerance, the normalization and increasing politicization of religion and a sacralization of politics, ethno-nationalism and the normalization of ethno-nationalism that denies the very notion of pluralism and diversity. And this normalization has really fueled a level of hateful rhetoric and hateful acts not seen in decades, even unfortunately on this campus. These are critically important issues and ones that demand to be discussed and debated, but would not normally be seen as the purview of the School of Foreign Service, but it assuredly is. To borrow from an iconic ad campaign, what happens in the US does not stay in the US. We have chosen to see ourselves as the shining city on the hill, a beacon of what we understood to be universal values of the inviolability of the individual, freedoms of speech, assembly, democratic processes, and yes, of religion. Defense and the promotion of those core values has been a cornerstone of our diplomacy for decades, as well as our domestic political discourse. Our greatness rests on our aspirational principles, a point that Secretary Madeleine Albright most eloquently remarked on from this stage only a month ago. It was not that we had attained all of our goals, that we lived daily all of our values, or that we always practiced what we would be very preachy about, but that the aspiration was there, the striving, the effort as Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of to bend the arc just a little bit more towards justice. To scramble my analogies for a bit, being a shining city on a hill is much like living in a glass house. And so this is the place and now is the time to talk about these issues here. They affect not only us, us here at home, but they affect our ability to remain a force for positive change in the world. It is not just the extremes, the violent fringe, the vile language, the uptick in hate crimes, but it is the normalization, a tolerance of intolerance that can corrode our democracy, that can damage us internationally, and that makes us vulnerable to our adversaries. A tolerance of intolerance at home enables those abroad who would use the same rhetoric, the same rationales, the same excuses to pass laws that silence discussion, as in Poland, that persecute minorities, as in Myanmar, or to call for the expulsion of immigrants and refugees, all other, um, as with Madame Le Pen in France. A tolerance of intolerance also betrays those in many, many parts of the world who share our aspirations, 
who seek to bend their own arc towards more justice. So yes, the line between domestic politics and foreign policy is blurred and becoming ever more so. And we must recognize that reality, our actions and our words have consequences. So this is indeed the right place to be discussing these very issues. This university was founded on the principle that serious and sustained discourse among people of different faiths and cultures and beliefs promotes intellectual, ethical, and spiritual understanding. What better place to explore these connections, identify these consequences, and mark the path forward than here at Georgetown? Before I introduce our president, I'd like to make special mention of the many centers that joined the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy to make this event possible. The Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, and its director, Sean Casey, who's gonna be participating in our discussion today. The Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and director, Rochelle Davis. The Center for Jewish Civilization, whose director, Jacques Berlinablau, is here with us as well. The Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and its director, Jonathan Brown. And of course, the campus ministries, especially Rabbi Rachel Gardner and Imam Hendi, it's wonderful to have you here. Thanks so much for your support and, and, and engagement and encouragement of this event. Now, let me pass on the floor to our president, someone who has been so critical in pushing these issues forward, John DiGioia. Thank you very much, Joel. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to be with all of you for this important symposium, as, as Dean Hellman has, has described, focused on re religious intolerance in America's image and policies abroad. And I wish to thank our, our, our Institute for the Study of Diplomacy and our School of Foreign Service for convening this gathering and for their efforts throughout the year to bring together distinguished diplomats, scholars, and students from within our community and beyond Healy Gates and the study of diplomacy. Today's symposium is one of several events scheduled this year to commemorate ISD's 40th anniversary. And I wish to thank its director, Ambassador Barbara Bodine, and all of the faculty, staff, and students who have contributed to the Institute's mission of convening dialogue around the important role of diplomacy and national policy over the course of these past four decades. In just a moment, Ambassador Bodine will introduce and invite to the stage today's extraordinary panel that includes Sean Casey, the director of our Berkeley Center, Rabbi David Saperstein, Farouk Kadwari, and Nancy Lindborg, who will serve as our moderator today. And to each of you, thank you for your presence here and for the reflections that you will offer. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Rabbi Rachel Gartner, our Director for Jewish Life, and Imam Yahya Hendi, our Director for Muslim Life, who will offer their responses to today's conversation later in the program. Today we gather to explore the impact of domestic religious intolerance on our nation's image and ability to pursue our policy objectives abroad. As we look back on recent years in our nation, these times have had their challenges, challenges that have required that required of us to come together in new, way, new ways, to look more deeply and honestly at our own history and at the injustice and intolerance that is still present in our country. Our identity as a Catholic and Jesuit institution provides us invaluable resources for this work. We're committed to the values of interfaith and intercultural dialogue, to coming together across communities in unity, in solidarity, in the work of pursuing a deeper peace in our world. In an address last year to the International Congress for Jesuit Education Delegates in Brazil, Father Arturo Sosa, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, shared reflections on the concept of reconciliation that have a particular resonance with this work and on today's gathering. He said, quote, the search for social justice and the creation of a culture of dialogue between cultures and religions are part of this service of reconciliation among human beings, between human beings and creation, and between human beings and God. 
We must, he tells us, build bridges to allow for dialogue. Close quote. Only by acknowledging our interdependence and our differences can we build bridges between faiths and cultures and backgrounds. We must recognize the possibility and promise of our work together and on the foundation of dialogue for the work of diplomacy. So I'd like to thank you all for your presence here today. It's a privilege to be here with you. And now I wish to welcome Ambassador Bar Barbara Bodine to the podium. Barbara. Thank you, Dean Hellman, and thank you, uh, President Joya, very much, um, and, very, and for your continued support of the Institute of Study of Diplomacy. Uh, the timeliness of this topic um, is certainly not in doubt, and Georgetown is uniquely positioned to host this event. And I'm thrilled to have these leaders um, before you, to bring, to bring, to, to bring before you uh, these leaders to discuss the global impact of religious intolerance in America. Um, as the Dean noted, uh, we have several partners in this endeavor today, the Berkeley Center, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, Center for Jewish Civilization, Muslim Christian Understanding, and the Campus Ministry. And I think that speaks to the sense on this campus that this is a core issue that needs to be discussed and one that touches every, everybody on this campus. America's core principles of equality, the inherent worth of the individual, the rule of law, and the freedom of speech, assembly, and religion are key components of our power and our appeal globally. And these values require unflagging vigilance. It is the constant striving, the continued private dedication to tolerance and public affirmation of the values of pluralism that truly support our power in the world. These norms have been built and reinforced by the activities and leadership of citizens, civil society, and public officials over centuries. These ideals give you, the United States the credibility to confront others on their human rights violations. And when we fail at this responsibility, when we wrap ourselves in a flag of ethno-nationalism or nativism, when we offer easy propaganda to terrorist groups like ISIS and others who are willing to use our hypocrisy against us, we diminish ourselves and we undercut our global role and our capacity to be champions of human rights. Domestic religious intolerance calls into question our unique democratic model. It limits our influence, undermines our credibility, undercuts our moral standing, and enables dangerous nativist practices globally. The grand ideas of, of who we are are encapsulated in our motto, e pluribus unum, out of one many. And we have failed in our, in our past. We continue to strive. Catholics were often demonized as a fifth column. Mormons and members of nonconformist Christian churches have their own fraught history. Anti-Semitism in America is ugly and not at all new. And according to the Anti-Defamation League, last year we witnessed the highest level of anti-Semitic anti incidents since records began in 1970. More recently, we have seen a frightening spike in anti-Muslim hate crimes. Twice as many Muslim hate crimes in 2016 than in 1996. And the, the 2016 record regrettably surpassed that of 2001. This is this de dehumanization of the other in a country whose global power is defined by its embrace of pluralism is a tragedy. It denies our history as a country, a, a history that predates our Constitution. The Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom was drafted by Thomas Jefferson in 1776 and passed in 1786, and his good friend James Madison included religious freedom among the first freedoms in the First Amendment. We've talked about how it, em it embodies, it emboldens domestic actors, such as white violent supremacists in Charlottesville and a self-proclaimed Nazi running for Congress in Illinois. It 
contributes to a dangerous arms race of intolerance used to support nativist and ethno-nationalist policies and parties abroad. It is not a purely American phenomenon, but we are a powerful enabler when we fail our ideals. In India, in Myanmar, in Europe, Poland, France, and too many other places. But if this phenomenon is common historical and a historical reality, why is it more of a menace now? Why have we put on this? It is because of the unprecedented interconnected world. The social media and technology amplifies the reverberations of this across transnational religious communities. It makes us more vulnerable to exploitation by our, by our adversaries online. As we have learned from the ongoing investigations into Russian meddling, other countries take advantage of and heighten our domestic tensions and our polarization. Just as the civil rights debates in 1950s and 70s were fodders to the Soviets, so now is our religious intolerance and bigotry an effort used to limit us at home and weaken us abroad. We offer them room to maneuver and to expand our influence. Early last year, I learned of an initiative called the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council dedicated to building bridges between religious communities to combat through active civic work and political engagement the common scourge of intolerance. I was pleased to learn that Fru Kathwari, who is a board member for the Institute, was actively involved as a co-chair. Theirs is but one model for building dialogue and ultimately cooperation to protect and promote religious pluralism in the United States. Our panel today has years of experience addressing domestic intolerance and U.S. influence abroad from both the perspective of government, civil society, and religious actors. Our moderator is Nancy Lindbergh, member of our board, and more importantly, president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, Prior to that, she was assistant, secretary, assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at USAID and President of Mercy Corps. Sean Casey is the Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and Professor in the Practice at our School of Foreign Service. He is also a Senior Fellow with the Luce Project on Religion and its Publics at the University of Virginia and was previously U.S. Special Representative for Religion and Global Affairs and Director of the U.S. Department of State's Office of Religion and Global Affairs. Farooq Kathwari is Chairman and President and CEO of Ethan Allen Interiors and a member of our board. He is also a member of the Board of Overseers of the International Rescue Committee, a member um, of the Council of Foreign Relations, Chairman Emeritus of Refugees International, founding co-chair of Muslim Jewish Advisory Council and on the International Advisory Council of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Not surprisingly, he is the winner. He has been awarded uh, much recognition for his active civic engagement in the pursuit of human rights and human dignity. David, Rabbi David Saperstein is Senior Research Fellow at the Berkeley Center and an adjunct professor here at Georgetown Center for Jewish Civilization. He previously served as U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, Director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, and the first chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He has, has headed several national religious coalitions, including co-chairing the Coalition to Preserve Religious Liberty. Um, and the NAACP, People for American Way, and World's Faith Development Dialogue. We could not be more pleased with this tremendous panel to speak to you today about this critical issue. Panelist? Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Barbara and President and Dean. Uh, it's really, a, really a pleasure to be here, talking with great friends and colleagues uh, about this topic. 
As Barbara mentioned, uh, I'm with U.S. Institute of Peace, which was founded by Congress 34 years ago, specifically to work on what are the practical ways of resolving and preventing violent conflict around the world. And one of our oldest programs is, in fact, religion and peace, because of the, the very clear uh, understanding that if you aren't able uh, to not just tolerate, but really to celebrate the diversity of religions in different countries, you will not be able to build peace. Um, and so I'm constantly running into the, the focus of this conversation when I travel and meet with uh, government and faith and civil society leaders in places like, like Myanmar or Iraq. Uh, and we talk to them about this as a very practical approach and practice. And they're keenly aware of what's going on in this country. And so our ability, uh, I mean, I run into the reality of the relationship almost every time I go overseas. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to make a few opening comments, and then we're going to have a conversation. Um, because I know each of you have uh, a lot of experience and thoughts on this. So, Farouk, we're going to start with you. Okay. Well, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and I've had a great privilege of uh, being associated with this university for about over 20 years. Nancy, I'll tell you a little bit about my own background and my experience in America. I came about a young 20-year-old, and from the beautiful mountains of Kashmir, an area of conflict, and ended up in beautiful Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and I say it's beautiful because to me it was an area, the lights were on, nobody stopped me. I was, it was freedom. To me that was America. Because it, unfortunately, the conflict over there had consumed us, our families were separated, my mother didn't see her children for 10 years, my father for 17, you know, we saw and what America was, it was freedom. And it was a freedom to practice your religion in the wherever way you wanted to. It was a freedom to, to, to progress. And to me, America in its diversity represented a microcosm of the world. This is where everybody came. And today we see there's a lot of stress and strain. I have the privilege, which you know, only last week I was advised, and it's a great, great honor that I'm getting the, the Ellis Island uh, Medal of Honor. So I looked at it, and I said, you know, what does it mean? And then among the quotes that they have there, there's a quote from a former president. It said, and I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing it, said, America should take the people who are in trouble, those are not the words exactly, from all over the world. They should come here and we should treat them, we should take them in. This was George Washington. Huh. Hmm. So now when we take a look at what's happened, and you know, I have never felt uh, any issues. I don't, people ask me in these 50 plus years when I came as a student, has there been an issue for me? I have not felt it. And I'm dealing with a company and an enterprise that has manufacturing in the Blue Ridge Mountains in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, and I've dealt with thousands of people. I have not had an issue. Even in Vermont, when I first went, you know, you got associated with people. I looked 2,000 of those Vermonters there. I said, you know, we have something in common. I said, I grew up in the mountains where we said that most of the problems of the world have been created by flatlanders. They cheered. <laughs> I, was, I was one of them. But now, I tell you this, the last few years, and this has, this has been growing up, this didn't happen right away, I see challenges. And I don't see challenges myself. People ask me, but I see concerns in the uh, eyes of my children. Uh, they're born here, they've grown up here, and they're concerned. It shouldn't be. So we have to say, why, why is this concern? And they're living in the New York area. They're not living in somewhere in the middle of the country where there are even more concerns. So it was at that time I said, 
that something has to be done. And tell me if I'm doing it too long, because I can always continue later, but um, <laughs> you tell me how long I have to speak, because I can speak and not give them any opportunity. Take, but take another couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. So it was at that time I was approached by Robert Silverman, who's here. He was a former State Department official. He had become the director of the Muslim Jewish um, advocacy at the American, uh, of the, uh, the AJC, the American Jewish uh, Committee. They said, we are forming this with an involvement, involvement with other Muslim organizations, a organization called MJAC, a Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, and they asked, um, they asked, they suggest that I should co-chair it. My first reaction was, should I do it in these times? Should I be involved in something where we are dealing with people all over the country? How, what would they be reaction? But I did, and I tell you one of the best things I did, it really, really has done a great work, but I think we can talk about it later. Great, thank you, great setup. Um, so this is a guy I usually see in other countries. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to see Ravis Saperstein here in the United States, delighted that you're, you're with us, and over to you. Well, first, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, not just because looking out in this audience are some of our closest friends and allies in the work that we're all involved with, and, uh, but to be with my distinguished panelists who are our friends and really great um, uh, Americans in, in the values that they stand for and work for day in and day out. So it's an honor to be with them and to be with you today. Um, and uh, President Healy, always, uh, Pre <laughs> President DeJoy, always a delight to be here at Healy Hall in Gaston uh, Auditorium to be part of these uh, extraordinary programs that you and the folks with you are, make possible. Um, for, uh, for over two years, I had the honor of uh, traveling the world on behalf of the United States um, to meet with religious communities, almost always minorities, facing discrimination and persecution. I engaged on their behalf, on behalf of our American commitment to the value of religious freedom for all, with ministries of just, ministers of justice, security, foreign affairs, uh, the, the heads of committees on religious affairs, occasionally heads of state, um, all, some were very eager to work with us to improve human rights and religious freedom. They were pleased to have U.S. support. For many of them, the idea that America first gave to the world had captured their moral imagination as well as ours. Um, one of America's greatest contributions was a revolutionary notion to flip the relationship of the individual and the group, the state, on its head, to assert that the rights that we had did not come from the decision of the state, but from within, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And in the three prongs of the Constitution dealing with religion, no religious test for office, free exercise of religion, no establishment of religion, we created for the first time in human history the promise of a country in which your rights as a citizen would not depend upon your religious identity, your religious practices, your religious beliefs. Like many of our visionary rights, it took us a long time to get there. But in the 1940s, the expansive interpretations of the Supreme Court on the issues of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause helped make that a reality in America. And the data, to a large extent, shows it in terms of religious identity, practices, and beliefs, and the role that people can play um, in American life. And that was precisely the era in which the, um, the formidable international covenants, so the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights were being forged, capturing many of these same ideas across the globe. So they're all across the globe. There are people who want to work with us on behalf of those kinds of values. But tragically, in too many places, authoritarian regimes, countries involved in persecution and discrimination have pushed back. And one thread of that pushback was to challenge the United States authority in this matter, citing America's infringement upon human rights, civil rights, religious freedom. Such pushback intensified with the start of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. 
His inflammatory verbal attacks on political opponents, Muslims, refugees, undocumented Latino immigrants, later on the once in office, the Muslim ban, and a range of other decisions that were made. We would be challenged by people who are you to preach to us. Look at the divisions you have. Look at how the police treat uh, African Americans in your country. Look at the fights over religious freedom that you have in your, in your country. Um, and this really does undermine our ability to be effective on behalf of human rights and religious freedom and religious liberty. And there are answers, you know, I have said repeatedly, I pray for the day that the kind of work that we have to do in the International Religious Freedom Office is to help countries decide whether or not corporations have free exercise rights, how to balance out the tension between religious freedom claims and civil rights, other civil rights claims. We are dealing with people who are being ethnically cleansed and victims of genocide, being arrested, tortured, imprisoned, um, brutalized, subject to societal attacks. Um, uh, yeah, these are different dimensions of the kinds of issues. And you know the answers. Everyone who works in the field of human rights knows the answers that we would, uh, we would give. American diplomats um, uh, and NGOs whose efforts are hurt and undermined by some of our problems will say, we have a free press that exposes these problems, allowing us to confront them. We still have a strong rule of law and a free court system that can offer protections to the weak and vulnerable. We have free elections that allow us to elect officials who are committed to addressing these problems. And we have a vibrant civil society and nonprofit sector able to speak out, to protest, to organize for change. Those are partial answers. But we know we face our own challenges on some of those fronts. Um, and in the end, in the end, while those can be an antidote to that, we'll only be successful if we're showing the world that we're using those institutions to affect improvements and changes that are going on. Just one other area here, that of blasphemy and apostasy, apostasy laws. Tenth of the countries have apostasy laws penalizing you for changing religion. Quarter of the countries have blasphemy laws. A number of them don't really enforce those laws. In 12 of those countries, there are death penalties and a range um, in the 80 countries um, in between. Um, uh, here. And we'll get pushback. Hey, look at your allies in Europe, the democratic countries that have blasphemy laws. And we made some improvement in recent years. Um, uh, here we've seen Iceland and Malta and uh, Denmark and other countries do away with long-standing laws and I hope to create a drumbeat and momentum on, on that because blasphemy punishes people for expressing their heartfelt beliefs. What is blasphemous to one group of people is the central core religious belief that uh, somebody has. And, you know, we did get pushback and, of course, I don't know how many of you know this, the one that I really got pushed back on was, yeah, how can you preach to us when there's six states in the United States that have blasphemy laws on the books? I don't know how many of you knew that. You know, those kind of right-wing states like Massachusetts, <laughs> and Pennsylvania, Michigan, and then there's Wyoming, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. Um, here, Supreme Court has stopped them from being implemented, but uh, when we were in the State Department, where Sean did such a remarkable job um, in the arena of religion and foreign policy, um, uh, here, when we were there, we couldn't speak on domestic issues. Um, here, now that we're free, um, I'm going to make it one of my campaigns to try and persuade those states um, to, uh, to really uh, put an end to this. Let me just close my, uh, my opening remarks with the words of, um, of an extraordinary rabbi, um, Joachim Prince, uh, who spoke immediately before Dr. King in the 1963 march um, on Washington. Um, uh, here, and he said the following, America must not be a, no a nation of onlookers. America must not remain silent. It must speak up and act, from the president down to the humblest of us, and not just for the sake of the Negro, not just for the sake of the black community, but for the sake of the image, the idea, the aspiration of America itself. Thank you, Rabbi.
Um, appreciate those words. Uh, and before we open it up to conversation, Sean, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you so much, and it is great to be here. I want to thank you and thank uh, Ambassador Bodine uh, and all the organizers. It's an honor to be here. Uh, back in the days when I was a, a Protestant minister and we were driving home from church with my two small children, uh, we developed a pattern where I would say, well, how, kids, how was Daddy's sermon? And they would say, Daddy, you did a fine job but you missed several good stopping points. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna to try to keep my points to three and keep them brief so that we, we can get to the conversation. Uh, my first observation is I, I completely agree with what David has said, that clearly we have paid a price internationally in terms of our prestige, our authority, our reputation, given the rise of, of populism here and in the various forms of, of religious bigotry that have grown particularly in the last three years. And there's no denying that. Uh, I try to resist my sort of dark Irish inclinations and always go to the darkest place by reminding myself, are there silver linings to be had here? And I think there's at least one. And my hope is that after we get through this period, and I, I believe we're gonna recover, I, I think our public democratic institutions are strong enough that one casualty that we might embrace is the notion of American exceptionalism, particularly when it comes to religion. If there's a way that we can recover our practice of religious tolerance here and begin to be more of a beacon to the world, it will not be from a position of cultural, theological, or political superiority. As I traveled around the world, I encountered a lot of people who at least symbolically had been bruised by American elbows, both politically and diplomatically, and that made our work very, very difficult. My hope is that as we try to deal with this internal demon that we have before us today, that we will respond and we will recover, but maybe we will lose the arrogance that's attached to American exceptionalism, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Secondly, now that I'm a lapsed diplomat and I'm back in higher <laughs> education, I, I'm trying to think what, what can we do as teachers and professors, particularly those of us who've worked our careers in religiously affiliated institutions. And it is, it's an amazing honor to be at this incredible institution, and I'm, I'm thankful for that every day. We have duties in civil society. We produce knowledge, we confront ignorance, we learn dialogically, and we have an extraordinary student body here in terms of diversity, global experience and wisdom, how can we help come alongside our students to become the kinds of global citizens the world needs? We can always do better, and I think these times call upon us who are in higher education, particularly at religiously uh, allied or affiliated institutions, to think, how can we train our students better to confront these forms of the lack of toleration? How can we help them be more effective at spreading toleration wherever they end up around the world or within our country? And having come from a, a, a theological seminary, a Protestant theological seminary before I went into the State Department, I have to say that at least among Christian institutions that train clergy, we do a lousy job of equipping clergy to deal with the increasing pluralism of not only America, but also the world. We have to do better in terms of training the leaders, at least of Christian communities. I, I have no expertise, I have no platform from which to comment on other theological traditions, either here or around the world. But in my own tribe, we have much work to do because we're training leaders in this country, and I think we have to ask ourselves, are we providing the kind of education that equips our graduates to do the kinds of things we think we, they should be doing? And finally, there's this research question. Here I'm gonna be very, very specific. I, I think one of the, the unanswered questions from a, a research perspective today is that when you look at the rise of the alt-right and the sort of new populism in America, to what extent are these folks being animated and fed and drawing political and moral warrants from their Christian homes, from their institutions of Christianity? And I have to say, I don't know what the answer to that is. But those of us who are in researching global populism but also domestic populism, we have to ask ourselves to what extent are Protestantism and Roman Catholicism funding, if you will, theologically, some of the kind of, of horrible things we're seeing on our streets today. In closing, I've spent this semester traveling to three very disparate 
religiously affiliated institutions of higher learning, one in Provo, Utah, uh, one in Hartford, Connecticut, and one in Abilene, Texas, which was my undergraduate alma mater. And in each place, I, I've seen students who give me great, great hope. Uh, in each of those places, there are more alt-right populist folks popping up in those zip codes. But to see these institutions of higher education in this generation of undergraduate students rising up and struggling to know what do I have to say, what do I have to do to push back the tides of intolerance, I'm, I'm in a sort of chastened, optimistic pa uh, position at this point because I see hope in, in that generation. Let me stop there. Well, thank you for, for leaving us with a note of hope. Um, and thank you, all three of you, for your comments. I want to pick up on a point that you raised and throw it to all three of you. Um, because I encounter in many of my uh, trips overseas and in a lot of the work that USIP does, the fact that uh, religious leaders, faith leaders, are often not equipped uh, in some cases, and uh, I saw Rabbi Saperstein in, in uh, Myanmar and Burma, the, the Buddhist monks there are often very ill-educated. They can barely read. They're easily prey to the kind of nationalistic, uh, hate-mongering rhetoric and, and enlisted in some of these campaigns. How much of that, in maybe a less overt way, but how much of that factors here? You alluded to it a little bit, Sean. And you know, just take a, I'd, I'd love to hear each of your respective views on how, how much do uh, faith leaders in this country contribute to what all of us have agreed is a sense of rising religious intolerance? And what do we do about it? Nancy, I think that, if, if I may, I'll slightly have a diversion. <laughs> the diversion is this, that we've got to take a look at many, many actions that have taken place over the years that has resulted into this. This didn't happen because President Trump took, out the, took office. I think we should take a look at the unintended consequences of our actions. It was actually right here at the School of Diplomacy, which I mentioned sometimes back, 20 years back, we had a committee which looked at the unintended consequences of things that would happen in the world. So I suggested, why don't we look at unintended consequences of our own actions? So Chester Crocker was heading it, and Tom Pickering was involved with it. I saw him earlier here. So what we did was, where's Tom? There he is, yeah. So we, we set up a committee and said, what's the, what were the unintended consequences if we invade a Muslim country? So just before our invasion of, of Iraq. And the committee did the deliberation and came to the conclusion, don't do it. It'll create tremendous amount of problems for us and the people there. Well, you go a little bit further back, because what we are talking about is just a symptom, something that has happened. It's a, there is a lots of problems. We take a look at what happened. I'm going a little bit back uh, in the fact that, uh, you know, last Saturday or Sunday, I was on six, listening on 60 Minutes, the Saudi crown prince. I'm, amazing what he was talking about. But look at this fact, in 1979, they changed their policies. We helped it, we created and helped them, through them went to help the Afghans fight the Soviets, because some people say because of the fact we want to teach them a lesson of what they did to us in Vietnam. Unintended consequences was a tremendous problems in the whole world, in that part of the world, which then came over here. So unintended consequences of our actions, this didn't happen. Our in, uh, this didn't happen, this intolerance and the effect of America's, we're talking about intolerance here, how is that going to be seen in the rest of the world? This is, is okay, but more important is a lot of our actions that have taken place, which we got to correct. We got to understand the fact that today, look at the Arab world is in chaos. And I don't want to go far back to the First World War, but look at what the colonial powers did in the breakup of the Middle East, the South, a South Asia. But we are today getting the unfortunate parts of those. So we've got to keep those in mind, that this is not just a question of uh, what has happened in the last few years. This has been growing up. Having said this, America, as I said earlier, is a hope. If we cannot have tolerance here, how are we going to have tolerance in the rest of the world? This is a country that people 
as I said, in microcosm, represents the diversity of the world in religions. So we have to work hard, because if we don't do it, but we also have to recognize that many of the actions, unfortunately, that have taken place have created this problem. So, so I think we've got to keep all of those factors in mind. So your diversion that you just took us on, Farouk, is actually positing that political actions that we took here prompted greater intolerance overseas. Are you then saying that that reflected back to create greater intolerance here, that the causality is coming in that direction? Absolutely. In fact, look at 9-11. I had an opportunity of meeting President Bush. I said to him, President Bush, call these folks uh, criminals. Don't call them terrorists. So, so gentlemen, do, do you agree that the causality is coming, that it is working in that sort of wave function? I think it's going in all directions. I, I don't want to give anybody a pass here. Uh, you know, if you, you look at my, the tribe of my childhood, I grew up in conservative Protestantism. Uh, we were at the forefront of the anti-Catholic wave against John Kennedy. Uh, I actually wrote a book on that and was stunned to see my particular tribe among this wider evangelical tribe is at, at the leading edge of that. Uh, the same is true in the freedom movement, the civil rights movement, that it was white Protestants of a certain set that were working against that. Uh, and it, it's my sense that indeed there, I mean, there are people who have access to the White House from that tribe who are actually problematic figures on these issues in terms of, of, of uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, neo-Nazi support, and, and I find that deeply, deeply troubling. I think we need, you know, my call for more research is really the, the answer, but my intuition based on sort of anecdote is that indeed there are, there are at least Christian leaders out there who are at least partially responsible for the uptick here domestically. David, do you? Uh, there, I, I just want to put a marker down. I, Sean raised interesting things about the civic education of people in our university campuses and the need for research. And I, I hope at some point um, we'll get back to them. Um, you, you all know the adage, I'm sure, that a million planes land safely, and there are no stories about it. One crashes, and the entire world has front page headlines about a plane crash. Um, I don't mean to at all minimize the disruptive, um, divisive, um, corrosive impact of religious leaders who are part of that segment of American society in that in their xenophobia and ethnocentricity and, uh, and religious supremacy, um, and sometimes uh, tied with racial um, uh, supremacy, um, uh, have done damage to America. There's another reality that day in and day out, all across America, um, people of varied religions are working together to solve problems in their local communities and to stand together against hate wherever it rises its head. Um, you just, amongst the many things that you do, um, the MJAC uh, coalition is an extraordinary and, example. And, and you're a member. In which, uh, which I'm honored to be a member. The shoulder, right the no, shoulder to yeah. shoulder coalition um, to uh, fight Islamophobia. I mean, one, uh, one pastor says he's going to burn a Koran and makes worldwide headlines. The responses of good people all across America um, and across the globe in civil society and religious communities, that often gets lost um, in, in what's going on. Much of the work that we did in the programmatic money that we had and Sean was doing is a core part of what he had to do in terms of his responsibilities in religious engagement was precisely to invest in building the skills of interfaith cooperation, interfaith understanding, um, enhancing civil society's capability to address these problems. It is always an uphill battle. In this country? No, just, no, no, across the globe, across what I'm talking globe. about, across the globe, based on the models that we have seen work so well here. It's a place where America, in a positive direction, um, has, uh, has led, and you and I have been in places. I mean, think about the coalition that helped stop in, um, um, uh, in Mandalay, um, the violence that happened there, or the work in the, uh, in the Central African Republic. Yep. 
we really go to interesting places uh, places together here. Um, It uh, you know that that is happening all across the uh, all across the globe. We see that happening, but it doesn't really get attention. Um, And uh, you know, there's a paradox here: the damage done by those uh, derisive, divisive voices is so much greater per pound than the voices of comedy and cooperation and coalition, one of the great paradoxes of our world um, uh, uh, that we live in. So I think you set out a thesis in the beginning we would all affirm um, uh, here, but I wanted to put the other side of it onto the table um, as well here. Shock. One, one place I saw this play out was in the refugee resettlement program. Uh, I was an alleged expert as a scholar on public-private partnerships, but it was embarrassed to come to the State Department and learn that actually the State Department pays for the first 90 to 120 days of refugees' uh, uh, entrance in the United States. And so it's literally, I think, the only diplomatic policy place where the State Department has a remit. Now, I took that as a get-out-of-jail-free card as the Special <laughs> Representative for Religion and Global Affairs. So in 2016, I traveled to six different religiously affiliated resettlement centers in problematic states where state politicians had said, no, 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 not in our backyard. They, they quickly discovered they actually didn't have legal authority to stop the, the federal resettlement. But what happened was a dialectic. Everywhere I went, the directors talked about a new form of interreligious collaboration. Uh, this sounds like a bad joke. I walked into the Jersey City Church World Service Refugee Resettlement Center, walked into the director's office, and there was a rabbi, an imam, and an evangelical pastor who all had congregations in central Jersey within shouting distance of each other, but they had never worked together until they came to the Refugee Resettlement Center. And they were doing new forms of interreligious collaboration that they had never done before. And I saw this everywhere I went in all six cities. However, now, because our government is ratcheting down refugee admissions, now the 29,000, heading possibly towards zero, there has been a reaction on the part of some forces, including our government, saying, no, 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 we're not going to do this kind of work anymore. And I think, in most part, it's, it's, a, it's an anti-immigrant, frankly, anti-Islam bias that, that's at play in this policy response. All of these nine refugee resettlement partners the State Department works with, six of which are religiously affiliated, are laying off staff now by the hundreds. So the capacity for this interreligious inchoate work is now actually in decline, and I think that's intentional. I think there are government and political forces that want us out of that business because they don't want toleration to grow, they don't want pluralism to grow. So I think there's a a push and a pull here domestically. So I'm not arguing against your your point, but I think it's, it's quite complex here. It speaks both to what is the resilience of the extraordinary networks and interfaith dialogues and basic investments that we as a nation have made for decades in creating religious tolerance. Uh, What is the resilience in the face of what seems to be driven at least in part by fear? Um, And this this is what we see in a lot of other countries as well, where you can harness people people's fears uh, in the service of terrible acts of intolerance. Um, So question is, what do you see as the resilience of these investments and networks? And number two is, how do we address the fear that seems to be at the root of what's happening? You know, I was uh, raising all those other issues just to get the point across that Certainly, the issue of intolerance here has a tremendous impl- impact overseas because uh, we, we, are, we have been looked upon, and we are, as I said, this is, a, this is an example of how people can live. This is people have come from all over. And when that gets damaged or bruised, it has an impact the rest of the world. So there's no question that we have to work. And we were having a, a conversation earlier, and I mentioned over there that, you know, I deal with folks, as I said, in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina and other places. If you talk to them, these are the silent majority. They do not know. It's a small little group that is vocal, and our job is to make sure that we reach the silent majority in terms of why religious tolerance is important. When we go and talk to them, they understand. So I think a lot more effort has to be done in that respect because the fact is we tend to spend most of the time talking to already the converted. 
The job is to go and talk to folks. They've got to see, for instance, when they see Muslims, most of these folks have not seen a Muslim. Or even, in some cases, they're biased against Jewish folks. So our responsibility is to do that. And that's why I think we do that, and that's a tremendously important objective that has got to be done. And as was said, that uh, as the rabbi said that, you know, bad news travels fast. And uh, all the media today is really just all they're doing is getting bad news out all the time. So, and we've got to see and find out how do we get some good news out. So th there's a tremendous opportunity because bottom line is that I have found people in many parts of the country, if they know you, they have a different perspective of you. Mm -hmm. If they don't know you, they get caught into what, what they feel. So I think the opportunity of getting that message across domestically, and then I think very, very importantly overseas, because as I said America, with all our faults, with all the problems of the past, we are the one that has got to set the standard and some sanity in the rest of the world. Who else is going to do it? Have, have we seen, have, can any of you recall a specific example of where violence overseas has been sparked by events here? Oh, yeah. I mean, you take the Korean burning that, that right. I talked about. Right. That did result in, uh, in violence in several places um, uh, across the globe. It really does have an impact um, uh, in, that, in that regard. So um, there were, and then, you know, there's violence and there's mass protests. There were mass protests around the Muslim ban um, in countries that, did, uh, that we have important strategic um, interests with and uh, need to be working more closely with, and this turned out to be a, a barrier. Let me just flag one other piece of this bit. Our divisiveness here, insofar as on Capitol Hill, it has really damaged the traditional bipartisan cooperation on a lot of these areas of foreign policy. It makes our work much, much more difficult um, in the funding of, uh, of so many of these things that we're talking about and um, that represent this kind of vision that we're espousing that Georgetown has always stood for. Um, in terms of uh, the ability to come up with um, agreement on how to deal with some of these international crises. Um, the divisions that have, uh, that have afflicted American society have clearly touched American politics. Um, you know, when I look back on the 20th century, it's hard for me to think of, uh, look, I'm Jewish, this is a Catholic institution. I know where Catholics and Jews work together um, on core issues to change America, from the labor movement to the, uh, uh, to the uh, anti-nuclear weapons movement, just going chronologically here to the civil rights movement, um, to the um, uh, Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War movements, to the women's rights movements, and the economic justice movements, and the environmental movements um, here, and the Soviet Jewry movement. There wasn't a single one of those that happened without a bipartisan coalition of uh, decency on Capitol Hill, um, and multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious coalitions of decency um, uh, across America. We're really seeing it very hard today to develop those kind of bipartisan individuals. So the divisiveness is having a direct impact on foreign policy and things they used to enjoy consensus. The, the, I don't think the positions that we're espousing are any different than those that once enjoyed bipartisan consensus, domestically or internationally, but today that consensus has broken down in, in meta political divisive issues, even when there is agreement, prevents them from working together. That clearly um, makes the reversal of this administration's withdrawing from leadership on multilateral um, uh, solutions to problems all across the globe much, much harder to, um, uh, to address. So we have both Sean and Farouk are wanting to respond to that, and I think we're coming to the end of the time. Well, we got time for this. So Sean, and then over to you. So, so two quick points. In terms of an example, our office did a lot of work on LGBT rights around the world, which is very, very complex. When you were at State. When I was at State. Um, and, you know, we got domestic political pushback. Some people said, well, you know, you guys were the tip of the Obama spear promoting gay marriage in Africa, which was, couldn't have been further from the truth. But we also wanted to do no harm to the activists we met. So we often met either in the embassy or in private homes. And, it was, and, and the message we got consistently was when there's violence, 
in the United States or if there's hate rhetoric in the United States, we experience more tension and more vulnerability on the street. In terms of resilience, I, I used to somewhat facetiously talk to my daughter. You know, when I first started the State Department gig, she was a senior in high school, and I, I would say, Sarah, you do more interreligious work at your high school lunch table and on the soccer pitch than I accomplish racking up tens of thousands of frequent flyer miles because there, at least in the public schools where, where she went, there was a, a global constituency. All the world's religions, large, medium, and small, were represented there. And they found a way, not because the adults had instructed them or had taught them, they found, and this is women's soccer, I, that's all I can speak about, I can't explain, I can't explain it for, for the male side of the sport, but in many ways the lived experience of American pluralism is a source of resilience. So today's 18 to 24 year olds, you know, in my childhood it was black white, mm -hmm. and we were busy not collaborating with each other back in, in the last millennium. So uh, to the extent that there's a great engine of resilience today, it is the lived religious pluralism in our public schools. But, but Fruch started us off by saying that he didn't fear, but his children do. Yes, that's right. That's what I said, because that's a change taking place. And you know, you talked about his, um, another unintended consequences if there's uh, issues here. The people who are recruiting people to create terror, they talk about these things. They use this as a, as, a, as a weapon to recruit. This is what America is doing. It's a war against Islam. This is against Muslims. So we have to be, to be aware of it. Now, we cannot, we cannot stop anything, all the things that these folks can do, but I think we have to understand its implications that, that, that this becomes a recruiting tool if you're not careful. Can I add a word about fear? Um, here, fear plays out in two ways. The fear at a social level, civic level, that people have of each other, we have some real experience of how to address that. We know that human interaction, face-to-face -face encounters, sharing social um, experiences together has a profound positive impact on it. The resilience question is tough because you go through one generation, they move on to other things, and you're always having to go back and continue the process of it happening. Fear at the same time, though, has led many governments in this country who are genuinely fearful of terrorism or destabilizing forces to use coercive, oppressive um, efforts that actually make the problem worse. And in terms of our statecraft, that's one of the central challenges um, uh, that, uh, you know, that we face on this. Um, here, and I think ISD is a wonderful institution um, to really help us think much more systematically um, uh, about that uh, uh, crucial challenge. That's a good point to end on. Uh, you know, the, the importance of never taking this for granted, I think, is a lesson that all of us have learned uh, with Im immense power over the last few years, that it's a continual process peace, some of the core values that we all hold dear, uh, we need to continually revisit and, and uh, reaffirm collectively. Um, I, I want to thank everybody both for your comments but also for sort of the innate optimism that was embedded in what everybody said. Um, I think that gives us uh, uh, good hope. I also was struck by the, um, the causality patterns that went in all directions and I think underscore how interconnected these, these issues, these ideas, these events are, uh, whether they're coming from here or there or influencing each other. But thank you, each of you. Thank you again. I'm going to pass it over to you, Barbara. Yes. Thank you for and, convening us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Um, and we are going to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. But I want to thank this panel, uh, all four of you. Uh, you were tremendous, uh, and I, you've encapsulated it very well. I, I do want to note that. For those of you who have programs, um, you might have noticed that, that there is supposed to be a Heidi up here. Uh, and Dr. Heidi Hatzel uh, is, is a victim of yesterday's storm, and she was not able to join us. So I want to thank Sean for, for stepping in uh, and doing a, a very good impersonation of a Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and no, this, this is. Your daughter would be proud. <laughs> Um, and before we open it up to questions, um, one of our, 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 our partners in this event uh, is Campus Ministry. 
And we have invited uh, Imam Yahya Hindi and Rabbi Rachel Gartner to come and give some respondent comments to, uh, to the panel. And then we will open it up to the rest of you. Thank you. I would love the world to see the United States in the eyes of Georgetown University. This is the, what I hope to be the image of America worldwide, where you have a Catholic university with an imam, a rabbi, a Protestant minister, a Hindu chaplain, and Orthodox Christians working together, challenging our students to think bigger than themselves, to think creatively how they can make the world a better world for all of us. But unfortunately, there's another picture of the United States of America, another narrative. So one of the things I wanted to respond with saying, we need to change the narrative. As the rabbi eloquently said, there are so many wonderful stories in the country that are not told. The fact that you have a, a Jewish Christian community raising funds to rebuild a mosque and after vandalism. The fact that you have the Muslim community raising funds to rebuild or reconstruct a, a Jewish cemetery after it was vandalized. So there are so many of these wonderful stories that are not told. My interest in the topic is shaped by the fact that I have been to so many 45, more than 45 countries with the State Department. And I found it quite difficult to prove that America is actually diverse, that America is actually pluralistic, that America actually respects Islam. Because the image out there is of politicians using Islamic terminology in a negative way, whether the term jihad or, or sharia or making references to the Quran that are very offensive to Muslims worldwide. Is that America? It's not. Is that the majority of Americans? It's not. But the fact that these are the voices that are made bigger uh, 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 with the story of um, the burning of the Quran. A small religious community made big hit news. I was a part of an event in Oak Ridge, Tennessee that brought together more than 700 Christian and Jewish leaders with a banner, burn a candle, not a Quran. Not a single TV station covered the story because that did not make news. But the problem is, again, in people who speak on behalf of the United States of America and make the wrong statement. Um, I would say nothing can threaten U.S. interests and can contribute to national and international lack of security more than what we do here at home to undermine the great values that can make America great, specifically pluralism and diversity. We cannot ask other nations to respect minorities and fail to do that here at home. We cannot ask other nations to stop using the a, a, a divisive religious language and allow it here at home. We cannot ask a clergy elsewhere to speak a language of inclusivity and yet empower its exclusivist religious voices here at home, empowered by political institutions. To conclude, I would say that number one, we need to change the narrative in order to do good diplomacy overseas, and, and therefore we need to focus on the good story of America. Number two, we need to challenge and have the courage to challenge our own co-religionists when they speak bad on behalf of our own religious communities. And therefore, I really value uh, uh, Sean's statement that he challenged his own religious community when it does wrong. 
The rabbi has to do that. The imam has to do that. I need to stand up to my own Muslim community when it does wrong on behalf of Islam. And by doing so, we give a better united front for, for good, good, good diplomacy. Uh, the last point is this. My faith, Islam, teaches us Muslims that diversity is God's will, intended will, for humanity. And therefore, to be a good Muslim, but also to be a good American, I need to empower diversity and believe that it is an act of worship and an act of faith. The last thing I would say is that, as my faith teaches, that we need not to tolerate each other, but rather to celebrate one another. Actually, I believe that tolerance is a bad term. Tolerance means I hate everything about you. It means I don't like you, but I'll do my best to tolerate you. And I don't want anyone to tolerate me. I want us to find ourselves ready to celebrate what we don't have in common, and not only to talk about the things that we have in common. Thank you. I can barely tolerate the word tolerance as well. <laughs> um, I just, you know, another story that doesn't, doesn't get told. Uh, a group of 18 rabbis were um, arrested in, in New York City, colleagues of mine. I did the wimpy thing and appeared on CNN while they were getting arrested to <laughs> tell the story. And while I was telling the story, it was sort of fascinating and ironic that the route that we had taken to march to uh, protest the Muslim ban as rabbis, 200 of us, was right over the subway line route that where swastikas had been put hours before and where we were using uh, Purell to wipe off the, the swastikas. And so the CNN story was rabbis protest anti-Semitism, but that's not what we were protesting. And so as the countdown was coming down, I said, ask me a question about the Muslim ban, because that's why we're here. So it's interesting how hard it is, even when you're invited to tell good stories, that sometimes they don't, uh, they don't always get told. Um, and I, I also just want to echo, you know, my son in third, uh, when he, well, last year, so fifth grade, he was called a dirty Jew by one of his friends in the D.C. public schools. I never thought, I thought we were, I never thought that would happen. I thought we were past that. So um, I just want to say I wear many kipot, many hats, although I don't actually wear one too often. Um, but here at Georgetown, just to respond to a couple of things, uh, you know, as the, the rabbi and director for Jewish Life, something that you, you raised, Sean, I, I, I really made, makes me want to respond, is how do we do this better? How do we train our clergy better? I think we also need to train our young people better. And this may be the only place where I like the word tolerance, is to be able to tolerate or become more comfortable being uncomfortable. Not comfortable being uncomfortable, but to tolerate, to tolerate um, hearing things that are hard for us to hear. We as educators need to help our students find the fortitude to uh, listen to things that push our buttons and the courage to say things that push others' buttons. Our job as educators and clergy is to help stabilize young people as they walk towards the heat, not away from it and help them find the courage to say fiery words, but also to listen to things that might be um, really fiery from somebody else, that might be painful to hear, but not to take that personally or be, feel implicated or burnt by them. I think we need to build up that capability in them. Um, that's, in my, that's the kippah I wear here at Georgetown. I also wear another yarmulke. I am a, a, a co-chair of Trua, the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights, which um, can sometimes be a difficult, uh, I, I inhabit a space that can be difficult sometimes, uh, to say the least, for other Jews to tolerate and uncomfortable t uh, for them and at worst infuriating because um, as a member of Rabbis for Human Rights, we look at human rights issues here and in Israel and Palestine. 
that space comes very naturally to me because I am called as a rabbi to be a road of shalom and a road of tzedek, a pursuer of peace and a pursuer of justice. And for me as a Jewish American rabbi, that means that I need to do that in the two places that hold my heart and my history. And that's Israel and the, and the United States. And I need to be vigilant in both places. I cannot tolerate, I'm using this word that I hate more than, uh, more than I'm using any other word, there you go. I can't tolerate when Israel is singled out. And at the same time, um, it is my job as a Jew to, and an American to be concerned with the cura personalis of both of these places, uh, the, the body and the soul the well-being of both. So the work that I do, I think I just want to say as a practitioner, and this is the last, this is the last piece, is how does this uh, impact me as a practitioner on the streets doing the justice work day-to-day uh, -day in my role in, in True in particular is I, I think in a, a few ways. The first is that it, um, all of this rhetoric saps our uh, moral you know, detracts from the, the always questionable moral high ground that we had, and I say always questionable for all the reasons we've said earlier. Um, you know, a pot calling the kettle black, it's really hard. Uh, people are not looking to us as human rights activists in some of the co communities that I dwell. They're not looking to us as for guidance anymore. Uh, in fact, the tide has shifted so that we're looking to some of our colleagues who do human rights work to say, not how do you strategize, but how do you survive? How do you survive a moment like this? How do you keep going? How do you wake up every day? And that takes energy away from strategizing towards doing good work on a very, very practical level. We also begin to ask the question on a very, very practical level. Can we do this work anymore? Is there so much to be done here in the United States that we can't focus internationally because we don't have the, the wherewithal? Um, and it can be very uh, exhausting for us. And will we lose capital if we're, we're spending too much time looking at human rights issues outside of the country when we have to spend our energy here? I will say, finally, that I think the, um, the resilience for, for me is in two places. It's in the rage. <laughs> there is some energy that goes, that comes from the rage. And there's also energy that comes from our awareness of reliance. Um, our reliance on one another to do this work across difference because we need each other now very, very much to um, congeal our power and to, um, to keep up our, to keep ourselves going. I think we need to keep the faith. Oops. Um, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions, and there is a microphone, and if you would identify yourself and uh, ask your question, please go ahead, ma'am. Hi, everyone. I'm Yusra Ghazi. I have the pleasure of working with um, Sean Casey at the State Department in the Office of Religion and Global Affairs. I now work um, in the Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau at the State Department. And um, one of the really interesting things that I've come across recently, growing up as a Muslim in the United States, um, it's very easy to say, see how our policies overseas, say in, uh, with, in regards to Israel and Palestine, or currently with um, our um, action or in our, action regarding the treatment of Rohingya communities in Burma, that it can create uh, tension between religious communities in the United States. Um, distrust, tension, uh, a lack of cooperation or understanding. And so I was really um, inspired to see programs like the Kennedy Luger Exchange Program that was started after 9-11 that brings in young people from Muslim and Arab countries to spend a year of high school with American families in the United States and how that experience of hosting a young person from another country uh, who practices a faith that's very foreign to a remote community in the United States can change the way that everyday Americans think about the world and about interreligious ties and relationships. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to, um, some of you have spoken about your experiences going overseas, working on human rights issues. In what ways uh, do you see our policies overseas positively impacting American society and how religiously diverse communities work together or um, perceive each other? 
And also, have there been examples of interreligious cooperation from your travels overseas that you feel are good models for us to apply here in our, um, in our American context? Thank you. I'll say two quick things. Uh, one of the most impressive things I saw in the State Department were the international visitors programs. And I think some, correct me, Amy, if I'm wrong, about 80,000 people are brought to the United States every year. Is that the right number? Too big? I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing yeses, I'm seeing noes. Uh, it's extraordinary. And, and the, the data shows that how many of those folks go back and become leaders around the world. And so that's not, uh, and what happens when you come to one of these programs, you visit three different American cities, and it's not like Washington, Alexandria, and then, you know, uh, Bethesda, right? <laughs> they, they actually get into real America. <laughs> And that was astonishing to see. Uh, one, one thing I saw in, in Israel, Palestine, and, and we spent a fair amount of time there, were a, a group of environmentalists from the three faith traditions there as scientists were working on access to potable water. And it was one of the few places in higher education where there in the space, Christians, Muslims, and Jews were united, not in interreligious explicitly oriented work, but trying to address a common problem across the geography there. And I found that to be so phenomenal to see. And I think, Shark, you, you were there, I think, in, in that meeting in the, in the American Center uh, in, in Jerusalem. And to hear these scientists talk about the, the scientific work and the benefits to all the communities was really powerful to see that sometimes you get at religious pluralism, not with religion as the yeah. presenting issue, but through addressing common needs that, you know, if potable water is not available, everybody's thirsty. And it was really remarkable to spend that day with that group of environmentalists. Yeah. You know, what I would also mention on this subject, but also what we discussed earlier, that there are, there's a lot of interest to have bipartisan, even though with all the divisions taking place. We had uh, two days back, a Senate uh, reception sponsored by Senator Grassley and Senator Feinstein. Mm -hmm. So we have in our, uh, uh, this uh, MJAC, uh, 44 persons, is bipartisan. We got, uh, it has business leaders, Republicans, Democrats. You can get people together. We have, uh, we have this uh, hate crimes bill that was passed by about over 400 votes in the House and then we are now in the process of having it voted in the Senate, and we had to do some work. We had to meet, meet folks. We had to meet uh, Senators uh, Grassley, Feinstein, Leahy's people, uh, and many others. And they both sponsored it. Now, this can happen. So in other words, with all this negative thing we are talking about, I think the opportunity is for us to get people together. That's why MJAC is. This is 44 persons, Muslims, Jewish, of, from business to uh, religious, they're getting together. They've been able to work together. And I think a lot more that needs to be done. And we're doing a step at a time. That is, the question was of this session was, how does it impact our image overseas? I think as we first we got to establish our brand here, then we got to get the message across internationally that this can happen here, and that's what we're going to do. Is there, an, is there another question? Yes. Well, okay, you're both being very polite. <laughs> I'm James Martone, and I actually work for television. So my first uh, comment is, I mean, I think we have to force the world to go beyond television and look at other things. Because, um, you know, like you're, the, the, the rabbi was talking about going on TV and speaking about something, but they were portraying it as something different that she wanted to say. So. How you do that, I don't know, but I think we have to learn to go beyond TV for our information. Also, sir, I, would, I was part of that program bringing people, I worked early on that State Department program bringing foreigners, and I, I, I agree, I think it was um, wonderful. And then, uh, sir, I forget your name, but all the way, oh, when you were talking about Vermont and you know, these, these areas, yeah. is, sorry, that, that perhaps aren't, people aren't aware of. The name of, is Farouk. Okay, Farouk. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I grew up in Washington, D.C., right. and I, 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 I think that there's as much racism here as there is in other parts of the country. So I don't think it's a, a you know, a, a rural um, 
city thing. My question to all of you is, I'm, I'm a, I lived as a part of my youth in the Middle East. I'm, I'm a practicing Catholic. I live in DC. Um, you know, we are seeing, uh, tragically, I think, minorities leaving the Middle East. And, and it's probably, unfortunately, with the exception of Israel, too late for, for, for the Jewish population. That, but for Christians leaving, you know, what sort of an impact do you think that that is going to have, that these ancient minorities that started in the Middle East are, are fleeing for whatever reason, you know, how, okay. what, what sort of... Re yeah. Yeah, we... Okay, that's a good question. Yes. Well, I was just in Iraq uh, in the Nineveh Plains and met with um, a whole group of, of Iraqi minorities who have formed an alliance, 20 different faith and ethnic groups who have come together. Um, and, you know, you hear throughout Iraq, especially with political leadership, bemoaning the loss of the diversity mm -hmm. of Iraq. And they, they yeah. seem to feel quite keenly that it will undermine the heart and soul of what it means to be Iraq. And mm -hmm. people of all yeah. faiths you know, are, feel connected to that very rich and diverse history. And at the same time, they're not jumping to make the kinds of changes that would enable those communities to stay, that are everything from increasing security to um, creating greater representation and participation in, in all manner of, of laws and legal bodies. I, I will say that there, there's, as much, there's as much division between and among these groups. I visited Bartala, where the big division is between Christian mm -hmm. and Shabak communities, uh, and going back to one of the questions I asked the panel, the community went through a negotiated process where they actually came up with a solution to a local problem, mm -hmm. but then it was stopped by their religious leaders mm -hmm. uh, who wanted to play a larger political game. And it does, I think, fundamentally go to this question that we didn't quite answer, which is, how do we address the role of faith leaders who often, who can be both very positive but often can be a big source of the problem? Now, just very briefly on this question, this chaos over there. The people with the violence are the ones who can take control and do things. There's no law and order. So what happens is people with diverse agendas, with negative agendas are the one who make these things happen. There's no rule of law, unfortunately. It's broken down in these countries. Yeah, please. May I just yeah. address sure. this point quickly? Yeah. Uh, one of the, the interesting things happening in religious studies today is the, the, the study of what's called lived religion. Uh, so for instance, back, back in the ancient days when, when the Office of Religion and Global Affairs was, was operative, I, I said we, we cannot be satisfied with meeting with the big hat leaders. They're almost always male, they're almost always of a certain age, and they have a view that they want to project to America. And I, say, I insist, well, let's meet with the locally employed staff at the embassies. You know, our, our embassies, yes. are, are most are the largest cadre we have working for us are locals who work for the embassy. Talk to them about what's really going on in these communities. Mm -hmm. And boy, did we yeah. learn different yeah. stuff from them. <laughs> Yep. That is really true. That but it's really hard true. when you're Mr. Mm -hmm. Big Shot mm -hmm. Guy from State Department, Washington, D.C., coming in. They don't let you sneak out and talk to people in the market. So we had to work harder to try to talk to, to the, what does it mean to be uh, a Chaldean Christian in Nineveh? You know, and yeah. the, the archbishop's going to have a view, and I'm not criticizing the archbishop, but to, to talk to <laughs> people at the rank and file to say what, What's it really like to be a, a Chaldean Christian here? We learned so much more and got such a richer picture, but it's hard. It's much easier to say, well, I, I met the, the sheikh, I, you know, I, I met the, the, the chief rabbi, I met the cardinal, and I've covered the religious leaders. So we, we can't be satisfied with just the view from the leadership. It's much harder, but much more informative, because there you see the texture, you see the diversity, you see the tension. Uh, which makes us much smarter as diplomats when we, we hear that. Uh, A very important observation. I couldn't agree with that more. That's, uh, I think we have one more question. We're running, we're a little over time, but we have one last question. So if everyone is fine, we'll just uh, give this gentleman the 
opportunity, please. My name is Miguel. I'm a doctoral student in the Liberal Studies program. I study contending paradigms of cultural diversity and multiculturalism. Uh, just an observation, uh, your animosity towards the term tolerance. Um, I respect that you've had a lifetime of seeing cycles of the joy and sadness that come from watching wars unfold, and I think that maybe that uh, grows from that. I would like to know, though, what narrative would you have us put forward, if not the word tolerance? I say that because we have the opportunity to learn as we encounter each other in Georgetown and as we grow from youth and academics to moving out into the world. We are exposed to languages, cultures, philosophies, and such, and we have the opportunity to understand each other. Um, maybe we are not turning back towards faith, but we can turn back towards understanding and learning about each other, through which I think an intermediate step is tolerance. What narrative then should we use, if not that word, not being those who have experienced the sadness and joys in these cycles? How do we sell this? Yeah. How do we get people on board think, with this I learning process? I think that's a great last question since tolerance has been, is, there's an intolerance for tolerance right now. <laughs> I think you, I mean, I'm, these are more, um, there are more experts, they will, they will have the final say. But I think use the right words, understand understand the perspective, whatever terminology. Understanding each other is what is important. Let's see what they have to say. Well, <laughs> I, I would say if you look at the history of the West, we went from the wars of religion to religious toleration to religious freedom. It was an evolution. Now, I'm, I'm not arrogant enough to say, well, here's the model for the rest of the world. But, but I'm, I'm loath to say toleration is a bad thing. You know, uh, and I'm, but so th there's not a one, there's not a historical narrative just because it happened in the West. I'm not saying everybody has to go through with that. But if there are conflicts and if toleration is, as you say, I, and I agree with it, sometimes it is an intermediate step to what we hope is something deeper, getting towards reconciliation, perhaps, as, as, as Dr. DeJoya said. So I, you know, I'll take toleration where people have been killing each other in the name of their respective faiths. Now, is it time? So we didn't go from the peace of Westphalia to Thomas Jefferson. We had to go through John Locke and through, through a number of things to get toleration become respectable. So I, I, you know, we don't go from crushing each other's skulls in the name of whatever our deity is to peace, love, and joy. It, it's often a, pro it's a process. There are increments there. And who are we to say that this country's path has to go this way and our path went that way? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'll take toleration. It's not perfect, but I'm, uh, I like toleration, but I, I'm not content with the world staying there. I think we, can, we have shown around the world there are places that have gone beyond toleration towards reconciliation, but these things play out slowly. And I think you've Rabbi, lift, you have the last word. And I think you've lifted up um, in your earlier comments ways that that happens. I talked about it's not just talking about who we are and what we are, it's sharing cultural, religious, um, social experiences together. It's working together on common problems that builds trust, um, that is sustainable and has resilience um, when, we're, when we're really um, in it together. And those are crucial problems. Um, allow me, since the last thing, just to flag two other uh, uh, issues here. Um, we're at a university, and I think the work, first of all, I think that what uh, Jack DeJoy has done to nurture the diversity of, uh, of different religious life and cultural life on the campus to deal with the past of this university in terms of the responsibility that we have to deal with intolerance, um, there has been really something um, uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, secondly, to um, Ambassador Bodin and to um, uh, Dr. Hellman, I would just make this appeal also. There is such important research that needs to be done. Better data than we have. We're often working on anecdotal experiences. We need better data and there's a partnership that we can have on this. I think one of the central challenges we have, we, we all see, I'm gonna use the term moderate religion, not having anything to do with how fundamentalist or liberal theology is, but I call a moderate anyone who shoes the use of force, either violent from themselves to impose their religious views on others or the coercive power of government to impose their views. We, it's in our interest um, and our values to nurture and support a moderate religious expressions and uh, activities across the, um, across the globe. But we're often very clumsy about it. Often, 
our Western democratic Jewish Christian embrace of moderate Buddhists, moderate Muslims, moderate um, Hindus, moderate whomever, is often used by radicals to delegitimize the very people we're trying to support and help, saying they're just uh, you know, agents of Western uh, values of, uh, of American Im cultural imperialism, of uh, Christian uh, evangelicalism, um, uh, et cetera. I just think we have to be more sophisticated, um, Miranda, and here's where I think a partnership can be really vital in figuring out a way to do it. And if I can just conclude with the words of Mukhtar Kent, um, who used to be the head of Coca-Cola, really uh, remarkable leader, here and for, um, Turkish. Turkish. and for Turkish, an immigrant uh, uh, from an immigrant family here. Um, he says, Jefferson's words, all men are created equal, which today we hear as human beings are being equal um, uh, here, they have a power to nourish. He said, there is no containing these words, no mere border, no barrier of language can stop them, no dictator, no army, no secret police can silence them, not now, not ever. America brought forth those words, and they are needed more vitally, not just in our rhetoric, but in the model that we offer the world, and in the effectiveness of how we pursue that in our foreign policy, needed more today than ever before in my lifetime. Excellent. Thank you. Well said, well again. Thank you, panel, very much. This was, this was uh, tremendous, and, and Imam and, and Rabbi, thank you for your, your responding comments. And thank you, audience, for uh, sharing this with us this afternoon. Thank you.